The video cassette recorder, or VCR, has to be one of the most important part of history when it comes to technology. It's what paved the way to some of the most common things we live with daily, from recording video with your cell phone to enjoying home entertainment. The VCR was built on technology of the videotape recorder, or VTR, released in the 60s that allowed television studios to replace film stock and making the recording for television applications cheaper and quicker, such as instant replays during televised sporting events. The first VCR for the home market was the Sony VO1600 U-Matic VCR, released in 1971. Sony followed that up with the Betamax, which was released in the US in November 1975. But the very first VHS VCR was a GVC HR3300 released to the public in Japan on October 31st, 1976 and became available to the US and UK markets in 1977. When Sony first came to the market with their Betamax machine, it was greeted with hostility by the movie industry saying that its device would infringe on their copyright. After two years of litigation, the district court ruled that non-commercial home use was considered fair use and that access to free public information was a First Amendment public interest served by this use. The decision was then reversed by a Ninth Circuit Court and then reversed again by the Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision. The decision had taken into consideration the testimony of Fred Rogers, that's right, Mr. Rogers, who supported the manufacturer. The judges stated that many producers were willing to allow private time shifting to continue. Meanwhile, JVC was strengthening its ties with Matsushita and other manufacturers like Hitachi, Mitsubishi and Sharp to back their VHS standard and so the battle began. The original Betamax tapes were only able to record one hour, while VHS was able to record two hours. This prompted the adult film industry to adopt the VHS standard, adding to that the fact that Sony did not want to allow pornography companies to use the technology for mass production. So by the end of the 1970s, erotic films accounted for over half of the videotape sales in the US, and some say this played a big part in the adoption of the VHS format. By 1980, JVC's VHS format controlled 60% of the North American market. Accepting defeat, Sony began making VHS recorders in 1988 but continued to manufacture beta recorders until 2002 and continued to make and sell beta video cassettes for almost 41 years until March 2016. In the late 1990s, Sony developed a DVD along with Philips, which officially released in North America in August 1997. But meanwhile, JVC along with Hitachi, Matsushita and Philips developed the digital VHS or DVHS and released it in 1998. The format allowed up to 50 gigabytes of storage, 3.5 hours of recording, while outputting a resolution of 1080i through its component output. The machine was also capable of playing VHS and SVHS tapes, albeit at their original analog resolution. From 2002 to 2004, DVHS movies were released under the D-Theater brand, which were of better and higher quality than DVDs on the market at the time, and Blu-ray had yet to be introduced. However, people were already adopting the new DVD format and the fact that DVHS was associated with VHS was both its strength and part of the reason for its demise. JVC continued to sell DVHS recorders until 2007. In a nutshell, you can see why the VCR played an important part of history and is of course part of our nostalgia of weekend renting and waiting for that new release by the counter that we brought back, popcorn making, kicking back and enjoying a movie in the comfort of your castle. Well, Mrs. RG bought me a VHS player she found at the thrift store for Christmas, so let's take a look inside and give it a new life. Hello everyone and welcome. I'm the Retro Repair Guy. Thank you and welcome to all the new and existing subscribers and I really, really mean it because uh, we're in December. I started my channel in late January, so we're just under a year and it's thanks to all of you that have helped me grown here um, or else I would not have nobody to talk to. <laughs> I'd be talking to Mrs. R.I.G. on the walls. And, uh, you know, Mrs. R.I.G. gets bored with this stuff. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you. It's thanks to you that I'm alive and that I keep going. Um, at the same time, you know, Mrs. R.I.G. bought me a VHS player, as you saw. Uh, now, can you imagine? She went to the thrift store. She actually went inside. She actually bought a VHS player, brought it back. This is a big step because Mrs. R.I.G. 
hates the thrift store. Okay, you'll never find her in there. <laughs> so, anyways, um, so it's a big step and a step in the right direction. But anyways, uh, all that to say that um, she brought me this VHS player and the reason I chose to fix it. Now, of course, she'd be upset if I didn't, but it's not really the issue. The issue is um, I've got a tons of VHS players on the back of the camera on top here. I got some in the back and I got some there. However, you see, last episode, I fixed a DVD player uh, that was a reference player. Now, I thought to myself, like, OK, but most people in America would not go out and buy reference players. So this, of course, you know, the thrift stores are full of VHS players now. And this was probably, uh, you know, obviously more common to all households in America. So I figured let's open up a regular unit like that that you can pick up, by the way, for 10 or 15 bucks uh, at the thrift store. Canadian, so it's like two bucks US, right? So, <laughs> anyways, but yeah, you can pick um, you can pick one up for really cheap, dirt cheap. And uh, like I said, these were players that were about $200 back then. And, you know, well, it was decent money and uh, that's what we were looking to buy. So I want to take a look inside. I want to see how good it really is and uh, by our standards. <laughs> OK, and what $200 would buy us today. And I'm not talking about those cheap $40, uh, you know, that Walmart VCR they were buying. This was really middle of the line uh, there somewhere. So I want to see inside. I want to take a look and see if we can give it a new life. These old VCRs didn't have much option when it came to video outputs and were limited to either a coax via the tuner or RCA cables. The VCR turns on but continuously flashes auto and nothing else happens. In order to wake it up, you have to insert a tape. I also realized I wouldn't get too far without a remote control and I distinctly remember having a Toshiba remote somewhere in one of my boxes. To my surprise and coincidence, according to the service manual, it turned out to be the remote that came with it. After popping in some fresh batteries, I see the remote is working fine. I didn't want to risk one of my movies to test the VCR, and I couldn't find my test tape from last time, so I found this old VHS tape in a bag that came from my uncle, explaining how to install a pond in your yard. Eerily enough, this was the second coincidence since Mrs. RRG was doing that in our yard and didn't finish before winter. Right. While moving on, the auto tracking was having a little trouble adjusting. Knowing it wasn't chewing up the tapes, I tried a movie for which I have several copies of on VHS. It's playing, but keeps jumping around a lot and this is a little more obvious if you look at the counter in the upper left corner. The dark scene is a little too dark that you can barely make out the details and I see some artifacts in the picture making me think the heads are probably dirty. I looked online for information about this player but couldn't find much. In the internet archives I found it on sale for $120 a few years after it was released and a couple of reviews from purchases as well as a few comments on another forum and it seems it was a love it or hate it. Some stated it performed very well on a great budget player, while others wrote that they had trouble with the auto tracking and that the counter always remained on by default unless you turned it off with the remote. So let's go ahead and open it up.
In this design, Toshiba integrated all the components onto one board and used a switching power supply. The board is separated into sections, and after a quick analysis, I decided I'll be recapping the power supply sections to future-proof the unit and try to improve the quality, as well as the I.O. section of the board. The capacitors I have on hand are always high-end audio capacitors. I had some of the most common values, so I went ahead and replaced them while I waited for the order I placed for the less common ones to come in, like the 82 microfarad capacitor in the switching power supply. I replaced them with Nishikon audio capacitors from their UKA line rated for 105 degrees. The board is single-sided and easy to work on, and the soldering doesn't require high temperature to melt, making replacing the capacitors an easy job. The order is in and I proceeded to replace the large capacitor. It was just beginning to show signs of ESR or resistance. I replaced it with a high grade capacitor from Nishikon's UCY line which is rated for high ripple current, 105 degrees and a 12,000 hour lifespan. Perfect for this type of application. While I did not test every single one, another capacitor I pulled from the power supply was showing both ESR and voltage loss. It's clear it was time for an upgrade. And here's the completed sections of the board. As you can see in the power supply, I recapped everything to the right up to the left side of the fuse. This should definitely help future proofing the unit. So having opened up the unit, I want to give you my two cents on it. First of all, this is not a unit that was built in Japan. It doesn't mean it's no good, but one of the reasons I'm saying this is because in the 80s and 90s, there was a certain quality that was expected of units that were built in Japan coming out of there. So that's number one. Number two is they tried to cheap out on a lot of stuff, okay? Uh, the faceplate, everything else around, it's all plastic, plastic, plastic. Not that sturdy plastic either, but anyways, I'm afraid when I open it up, there's little tabs, I'm pulling on them uh, to take out the faceplate and stuff like that, and I'm afraid they're gonna break. They're old and it's plastic, so it can very easily break. So that's number one, I'm having you know a lot of problems with all this. Uh, the unit itself also, if I'm going to backtrack here, I'm going to go to the last episodes when I, I um, did a DVD player that was a reference player. The reference player, everything was, you know, copper uh, plated. After that, they had actually made out of copper, excuse me, not even copper plate. It was made out of copper, the whole chassis. The thing was weighted. They separated the boards into sections, right? You had a board for the power supply, a board for the sound, a board for everything. So all that made it they could make thicker traces. So everything was a good quality components as well. They had like audio capacitors, everything. So comparing to that, you look at this unit and you go like, okay, well, obviously I understand why this is a reference unit, but it doesn't mean it's not going to perform well. The only problem is that they tried to condense absolutely everything onto one board. By doing that, okay, first of all, all the traces are very, very tiny. They compressed everything onto one board, single-sided. They also had to use a switching power supply because of that. Now the switching power supply, um, the capacitors, I should say, on them are a lot uh, more prone to failure because it's a switching power supply. Uh, a power, switching power supply also makes a lot more noise, okay? So there's a lot of things like that that are gonna affect the quality, which is also why I chose to recap only those sections. To recap the whole power supply, switching power supply uh, section, with high quality components and then while i was there while well, the in out section so uh when also you're changing capacitors especially for a switching power supply you want to go with high end components okay for many reasons and you want to make sure that it can take it so the thing is is that when you're buying and, and i'm not getting paid for this i'm just saying when i buy i buy from big places digikey mauser whatever okay and i'm not affiliated with them i don't get any money from them I'm just saying buy from a big place if you buy on a jungle site if you buy on ebay you don't know where they've been you don't know how long they've been on a shelf um the thing is is that there you know they're coming from a good quality source i buy uh nishikon japanese uh made uh excuse me capacitors uh, there's also rubicon there's a lot of other good manufacturers this is just what i use okay and i'm selecting high quality components to change so we're going to see what the outcome is but all in all um oh, by the way the heads are, are really they look like really good quality uh and it's a the four heads so all all those are okay so it shouldn't affect the quality but i'm sure we're going to give it a little bit better with those components and we'll see the outcome after
Cleaning the heads and transport mechanism is very important when servicing as this is where most tracking errors and audio dropouts occur. By the way, just for reference, this is a cylinder or drum assembly and this is the head. Someone's been in here before and put grease and finger marks all over the drum and even scratched it. It looks and feels like a tiny surface scratch so I don't think it'll damage the tape or affect playback but whoever was in here did not know what they were doing. The pinch roller looks and feels a little shiny and feels slippery to the touch. It's surprising that it didn't slip and eat up the tape. I had to clean the whole drum and heads five times to remove all the grease and finger marks. And of course, I'm using 99% alcohol for the job. I then cleaned the guide rollers and guide posts. I turned the capstan motor from underneath to make sure I cleaned it all around. Last but not least, I cleaned the audio and full erase head. For the pinch roller, I used Rubber Renew. The product helps rejuvenate and condition rubber. I applied the product a total of three times until it felt right to the touch. The belt is warped and lost its elasticity. I replaced it with a belt that's just a touch smaller to account for the wear. I then cleaned the pulleys where the old belt was sitting to ensure proper traction from the new belt. I greased the mechanism before putting the new belt on. I also added new grease to the loading motor gears, roller guide tracks and other gears. Here's what the drum assembly looks like after cleaning. So when it comes to head cleaning, um, I, this is not a course on how to clean heads. I just want to tell you what I do, okay? Uh, and give you a couple of suggestions. Now, before you do so, buy yourself one of those $10 VCRs, experiment on it, before you do something on a more expensive one, okay? Just if you want. Um, there's a lot of Q-tips out there that they sell, right? for the heads. They sell these chamois ones, these special foam ones for your, okay, they're 60 bucks a pack. You wanna go and spend 60 bucks to clean the heads? Go ahead on a $10 VCR. The other thing is I can guarantee you the guys I've worked with over the years who are charging 25, 30 bucks for a head cleaning, we're not using $60 of Q-tips. I used about 10, 12 of these to clean the heads because there's so much grease and so much whoever put their hands on there. If you think I'm gonna spend 60 bucks to clean it, no way, okay? These electronic um, uh, swabs, they're very, I've been pulling at it for a while now, okay? But just to show you, it's very, very hard to pull stuff out of it. And that's because I've been pulling for a long time at it, okay? It's very, very hard to get, here's the other side, I haven't pulled, it's very, very hard to get stuff out of it, okay? Um, they're very tightly wound. Um, the thing is, is that I'm not gonna tell you, you use a Q-tip for your ear because that pulls away. Also, the head itself, when you're rubbing back and forth, back and forth like this, you want to clean, okay? There's a little hole, okay? And if I haven't shown the picture yet, I will, um, of the VHS head. The little hole is where the head is. There are four little holes. Those are your four heads. The last thing you want to do is get something stuck in there, like a Q-tip, and then there's a tiny, tiny little wire that's wrapped around, okay? And... Um, the tiny little wire, if you get something stuck like a Q-tip and you pull, the wire pulls, you're finished. You're gone. The head, the whole head is garbage. So you want to avoid that, all right? Um, try to really, you know, go around and all that and clean it. So uh, that's number one for, for, the, for the stuff, like I said, for these uh, Q-tips. Number two is um, I rarely have to demagnetize the heads. I mean, we do it sometimes, good practice, if it's been a while or whatever, like an old VCR, yeah, you, you could do it. The point is, you come to, to know when, when it needs it, okay? If you don't, I'm going to tell you again to buy a $40 head demagnetizer, okay? A lot of people have these at home. Remember these? They're always around somewhere, right? Um, you can demagnetize tools, for example, with this. It's the same thing. You just put a wire from here to here. Now, again... Don't do what you see on the internet. I'm just explaining what I do, okay? So what I do is I use one of these, put a wire, a coil like that, and it became a demagnetizer. I demagnetize my screwdrivers with that if I want to work on something that, um, you know, make sure that it's not magnetized, for example, and especially on VCRs, better to work with screwdrivers that are not magnetized and stuff like that. And you know what? You can use it. You can use it to demagnetize. Now, how do you demagnetize? Click. Go in, just around it, come back, release it. It's demagnetized, okay? You wanna spend 40 bucks on a tool? If you have this lying around, try it, it works. I know I'm gonna get comments. I love comments. 
I am going to get comments about these as well. But this is me. That's how I do. That's how I've been doing it for years. And it works.
I'm always happy when I see the unit turn on. I did a side-by-side -side comparison as I did with the DVD player in last episode to show the difference in quality. The dark scene is much clearer and it's easier to see the details. I left the counter on so you can see that the jittering is gone. There's a lot less noise in the picture and the colors are much nicer. The initial testing before the restoration shows a harsh image compared to the one after. I even put in the old installation tape, and while it's clear that the tape has seen better days, it's still much clearer and the auto tracking adjusts itself perfectly. And again, you can see from the counter that all the jittering is gone. So as I was saying, it doesn't mean it has to be bad quality. It's actually, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with the picture. It's uh, for a VHS player. It's old. It's old cassettes. Um, you know, it's not that bad. It's okay. It's clean. It's decent. Uh, maybe I'll keep it around. Maybe I'll put on uh, for sale. By the way, the website, I've been working on it. Um, it's functional. It's accepting donations. You can see a little bio if you're interested. Uh, but aside from that, the items... I will be putting now during the holidays uh, on sale there. Now I'm going to try, I put all the descriptions. If I fix it, I'll put a link to the uh, video as well that you can see. And what I'll do is I'll make a, a certificate. It'll be something quality. I'm trying to make something nice uh, that at least will be signed by me. It'll come with it and saying that this was repaired uh, by me. So, you know, a little something, whatever that comes with it. Uh, and of course, all the money will go to supporting the channel, okay? There's no third party. There's only, of course, the credit card companies or the shipping. Uh, I don't make money on the shipping. Whatever it's going to be, uh, it'll be charged in there, and that's it. Um, but so you know that if you buy something, it'll be really supporting the channel, and hopefully you'll get something that'll be nice that was fixed by me, uh, you know, because you, you see I put a lot of work into them. I completely dismantled them and, and fixed them nice. So anyways, aside from that, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. The last year has gone by so fast. Uh, and thank you for being there. Thank you for uh, supporting me by subscribing, by everything that you do. And I hope that you guys will be there for 2022, that you'll be following us again. And that uh, you'll be there for the new episode in a couple of weeks. And thank you so much for everything. I wish you a Merry, Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, Happy Holidays, and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.